بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده غير مقنوط من رحمته ولا مخلو من نعمته ولا مأيوس من مغفرته ولا مستنكف من عبادته ثم الصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على خير خلقه النبي المكرم سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين وصحبه المنتجبين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Lord of all created things we praise him while being not despondent of receiving blessing and mercy from him and being mindful of the fact that his ni'mah and blessing showering us and never stay away and feel awkward of submitting to him we convey our greeting and salutation to the Holy Prophet of Islam, the most select of all prophets and his pure progenies. Sisters and brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I should add our viewers as well. Welcome to the sixth night of our program, Muharram 2020. We start with saying salam to Karbala. Assalamu alaikum ya Abu Abdullah. Wa ala al-arwah al-lati hallat bi fina'ik. Alaikum inni salamu Allah abadan ma baqeet wa baqiya al-layla wa al-nahar. Wa la ja'alahu Allah akhir al-ahd minni la ziyaratakum. Assalamu ala al-Husayn wa ala Ali ibn al-Husayn wa ala awlad al-Husayn wa ala ashab al-Husayn. نقل عن علي عليه الصلاة والسلام أنه قال لأحد أصحابه عاصم بن زياد حين لبس العباء وترك الملاء ويحك إن الله عز وجل فرض على أئمة العدل أن يقدروا أنفسهم بضعيفة الناس كي لا يتبيغ بالفقير فقره O oh, awesome, Allah the Sublime has obligated the leaders of a just and truth to the society to maintain themselves at the level of the poor and the marginalized and low income so that such people will not be despondent over their poverty. We start again as usual with a brief Recap. Last night, the backdrop to our conversation was an attempt to look at the concept of justice through Amir al Mumineen's approach or lens or worldview. In response to a question that he was asked, if he could state whether justice or philanthropy and Jude, were, which one were higher ranking and superior, Amir al Mu'minin responded that to him, the way he looked at things from the long sighted approach justice was more superior or superior to Jude and philanthropy for two reasons. Number one, justice puts everything in perspective, which means creates balance. And justice has much wider scope than Jude and generosity. We briefly pointed out that if we were to ask anyone within this center outside 
What did they think of justice? There is an overlap, some kind of everyone concurs and agrees. Yes, it's a wonderful idea. And would you, if you were to ask them, would you work for the crystallization and actualization of justice? Certainly they would. Nobody would say, even the most tyrant individual on earth, when you ask them whether they support justice, naturally they do. The problem is when we come to the application where differences of opinion develop. Imam's response, as far as justice goes, is in the macro level. How this macro level can be broken down into micro, social, individual, political, and economic. Those of you who want to find out, they really need to go to Nahj al and see what Amir al muminin says regarding how this greater schema of justice can be applied into this small micro level on, on a social structure. If we were to look at uh, Quran and our literature, we see that the concept of justice, briefly I pointed out last night, is the foundation to everything in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands man mankind or humans to behave in a fair and just manner. To protect the right of others to be fair and just with people. And in business dealing, be just and fair and to honor agreements and contracts. To help and be fair with the, with the needy, with the poor, with the orphans, with the destitutes. To be just even to one's enemy. Again, these are things that we can find in, within the Holy Quran. Allah commands human to establish just, a just society and commands the rulers to be just and ordinary people to be able to stand up for justice and against the oppressor and in favor of the oppressed. In the same vein, Islam come in the state, in the political uh, climate, commands the state to structure a public policy that establishes justice, and if for whatever reason humans fail to establish or to play or comply with justice, it is the role of the institution, the political institution, to restore this justice. This is all over. I mean, you have verses in the Holy Quran, you have a hadith, uh, you have uh, from the Holy Prophet, our Imams, and so on, they talk about it. And if one of the criteria by which you can delineate whether a society is the, on the right path or not is whether the society stands for these values, social justice, or any other form of justice that uh, we see it. Now let's go to this, uh, to the, what I recited earlier. There is a story behind it. One of Amir al muminins disciples by the name of Allah ibn Ziyad comes to him and complains, Ya, ya Amir al muminin I have a complaint against my brother. Imam asks, why? He says, somehow he has uh, dressed himself in a woolen cloth and cloak and left everything, leading a very austere way of life, left his family and children uh, by themselves, and he has become, with a misconception, people misunderstood, they become Zayed, somehow austere and a monkish style. Amir al muminin goes to see Asim, and uh, criticizes him for this way of life. He says, who told you to behave like this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted you so much. You have given wealth, you have given uh, health and everything else. 
Who told you to reject all these and then move into this kind of petty, austere life that nobody is recommending you? Wearing a woolen cloth and finding a corner and simply praying. He, this awesome response and says, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, it is strange that you are telling me or criticizing me or rebuking me for this austere way of life. But if I look at your life, your life is worse than mine. So on what basis you criticize me? This is why Amir al-Mu'mineen comes in and responds and frames a standard for the political rulers, for a just, just political rulers in, in an Islamic society. He says, إن الله فرض على أئمة العدل أن يقدروا أنفسهم بضعفة الناس Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded the leader, the just leader of the society, if they try to establish a way of life for themselves, to be the mirror image of the lowest, the poorest member of the community, or even below. So that the poor and then the poverty stricken within the society should not feel despondent and dejected and alienated within the society. And it is this criteria Amir al-Mu'mineen uses, uh, his unique and uh, uncompromising understanding of justice. For him, justice is indivisible. You cannot say, I apply justice when it comes to economic. In political, there is oppression. Or in social, there is class system. That's why when he was, uh, people swore bay'a and oath of bay'a to him, immediately in his first statement, what does he do? He makes that now that I am in charge, my understanding of justice differs from the others. I swear by God, if the money that had collected before have been used to purchase either slaves or even married, you use it to marry wives and so on, I would nullify them. Why? Because you have no authority to take these money from Baitul Mal. It wasn't yours. And this kind of approach when uh, when he became the, the, the leader, people began to advise him, leave this aside, don't approach that one, leave Muawiyah for a short period of time, don't challenge Talha, don't challenge Zubair, give them a chance and then you can decide once your power is strengthened. He said, I'm not going to do it. Accepting the fact that they have been wrong, unjust when it comes to the use of public treasury, it is my obligation through my lens of justice to take that money back. Now, where did this wealth come from and how did that affect the, the whole dynamics of the, the early Muslim society? Immediately after the Holy Prophet, at least during the reign of the first Khalif Abu Bakr, Muslim community really did not have much as far as income beyond a little bit of zakat. This is why Abu Bakr was so insistent that anybody that would not pay zakat, they would send Khalid ibn Walid to kill. Why? Because that little bit of money, zakat coming into the treasury, became a must, something that was needed for Baytul Mah. But as time went on and Muslims began to spread around the world and began to have uh, the spoils of war coming in, lands that were captured, jizya and taxes from Ahlul Kitab, uh, these are taxes from the businesses of non-Muslims, in addition to the, uh, to the zakat, brought huge amount of money into the uh, public treasury during at least the latter part of Omar, uh, Omar the second Khalifa. Unfortunately, 
Instead of creating a balanced society and just distribution of the wealth between the, the, the Muslim community, Omar embarked on a policy that uh, literally wealth distribution, public wealth distribution, based on institutional hierarchy, artificially created hierarchy within the society, and then based on this hierarchy, everybody was given to them accordingly. Just give you one example. Omar paid the wives of the Holy Prophet, every one of them, 6,000 dirham a year. Aisha, 12,000. Fatima and Ali combined 4,000. After taking the Fadak away from them. Uh, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, this is the, the rich, wealthy individual, the uncle of the Holy Prophet, gets 12,000. And yet, uh, an Egyptian soldier that fights for the sake of Islam, 300. Muawiyah and Abu Sufyan, his father, get 5,000 each. An ordinary person in Mecca gets 600 dirham. So this not only gave to few individuals, it became an institution, favoritism. He favored tribe of mother against the tribe of Rabia, and Aus against Khazraj. Arabs are, if those of you who have read the history of Arabs, Arabs are divided into two major bloodlines, from Adnan and from Qahtan. Adnan's bloodline has two major tribes or uh, components, Mudar and Rabi'ah. Quraysh comes from Mudar. So naturally, Omar favors Quraysh against Rabi'ah from the same clan, the larger Adnan bloodline. And favors Aus against Khazraj. Those of you who remember what happened in Saqif a couple of nights ago, if it wasn't for Aus, bolting and not supporting Khazraj, Abu Bakr would not have been able to resolve uh, the, the, the conundrum and get the power. Once began to put one against the other, the first one that jumped and switched side was Os. And what happened? When Omar comes to power, he pays them back for what they have done. Both tribes in Medina, both are Ansar, both together opened uh, Medina for, uh, for the Mahajarun to come in. Why Aus against Khazraj? Because Aus supported uh, in Saqifa these individuals, Khazraj didn't. Now, this unique hierarchical structure created a class system in early Islamic uh, polity that when Uthman comes to power, capitalizes on and abuses extensively. Those of you who have read a little bit about at least alienation in Western society, Western uh, uh, so, uh, political science, by default, when you create a society, a class society of a have and have not, superior, inferior, you are leading gradually institutionalized favoritism, you are leading towards some kind of a society which becomes fractured and dis uh, dysfunctional and leads to alienation and content of the ones that has been marginalized against the ones that has been uh, favored. And that's exactly what happened. In all the affairs that come in, Aus and Khazraj, Mudar and Rabi'a, Arabs and Ajams, Quraysh against others, they all had different ideas and different uh, levels of income from Baytul Mal. Ultimately, the social structure that Quran talks about, that the framework for unity should be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was fractured, disturbed in favor of dividing the community. Naturally, when you have 
the aristocracy, and this is exactly what happened, the birth of a new, what we call in the uh, Marxist or neo-Marxist language, bourgeoisie group, but in the, uh, the, the other language, some kind of class structure. And this is something that the Orientalists have been paying attention to as when they become critical of the concept of justice in Islam. Because they clearly focus on this. And all an alienated group of people within the Muslim community become the base for all kinds of tension within the society. Now, Omar goes, Uthman comes in. Uthman introduces, comes to the office, introduces and, and institutionalizes an economic policy that no Muslim had heard before, not even during Omar's time. At least Omar would distribute a little bit for others. This time, Uthman comes to power and focuses primarily on his family, his supporters, next of kin, and hundreds of thousands of dinars and dirham, not from his own money, if it was, I wish he would have spent it from his own money, from Beitul Mal, which is the money, the wealth to be given to the poor and the needy within the society, was given to these uh, so-called aristocratic group of people. This is now a religious aristocracy, religious bourgeoisie that they come in. Islam becomes a way of earning for them. If you don't, I am the Sahaba of the Holy Prophet. My position is higher under what? Immediately you go back to the uh, uh, sunnah of the previous Khalif. This is what Omar did, and this is what, Uthman, what Abu Bakr did. You go to Shura, the concept of Shura, Ali is challenged, are you prepared to follow the sunnah of the previous Khalif? He says, no, I'm prepared to book according to the Quran and the sunnah of the Holy Prophet. They switch, they go somewhere else. So, when Uthman comes to power, and what Uthman did, as far as favoritism of his own uh, group, it literally permeated through the society, uh, Muslim society, and covered the entire stratum of the Muslim community. There, his representatives all over the world would do the same thing. Why? Because the Khalifa is doing it. Fadak, Abu Bakr took it under fictitious uh, hadith from uh, Fatima Zahra, although it wasn't inherited. It became a political uh, ball or uh, that played around with it. During Uthman, Fadak is given to Marwar ibn al-Hakam, his son-in-law. This is the same guy that uh, the Holy Prophet kicked out of Medina, Marwan and his father. They were made persona non grata outside the Medina and until Uthman, not I, neither Abu Bakr or Umar were prepared to bring him back to Medina. But Uthman did. Brought him in married him to his daughter, and immediately compensated for the years of exile with 100,000 dinars. Go and read Tabaqat uh, al-Kubra, Al-Kamil fi tarikh Mal ibn Athir, Tariqh Tabari, Al-Ya'qubi, and others. List of these Mu'arrakhin from Ahl sunnah they list them. Let me give you a couple of examples. Marhum, uh, Shamsuddin has a book, Hussein, Thawrat al Hussein, Ahdafuhu wa Maqasiduh. In that book, he lists a number of examples. It's mind boggling. Those of you who work in accounting, you can go home and look, at, look up this up in, on Google or anywhere else. It's, there is a concept in accounting, you call it net present value. If you want to calculate what, what, what would be your worth of money now in, uh, compared to the money that was given to you 20 years ago. We use this in calculation of mahr and equivalent after 20, 30, or 40 years of marriage. It's a simple calculation. 
Fifty years ago, somebody married somebody else based on a dowry that said, for example, 5,000 liras. After 50,000 year, 50, years, of 50 years, how much 5,000 lira is worth now? Very simple calculation. Now, listen to this. The wealth of Zubair had reached 50,000 dinars and a thousand di uh, each dinar gold is about one-sixth of an ounce. So if you have an ounce of gold now around $1,800, divided on six, so you're talking each dinar of uh, then was, is worth now uh, around $300. So he has at least cash, 50,000 dinars in his house, multiplied by 300. That's about $15 million. But $15 million, 1,400 years ago, not now. Now go back to the net present value of calculation and see what it would be. Billions, if not trillions of dollars. This is just one Sahaba. The earning of Talha, another Sahaba, amounted to a thousand dinar a day from his lands and other places from Iraq only. Ali says that I came to Kufa with two shirts and I still have them. One pair of na'lain or slippers and he constantly mended them until Ibn Abbas told him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, throw it out. It's not worth it. He said to me, you're to be leader for you if it wasn't for the responsibility that I have to take the right of the oppressed from the oppressor, that leadership is worth less than this slipper. And he has one piece of bread that he breaks it with his knees and secures it in a place so his son would not come and add a little bit of salt to it. Yet, these are under the name of the Holy Prophet uh, and becoming Sahaba of the Holy Prophet. They, and, uh, Talha, 1,000 dinar a day from his lands in Iraq only. Then Abdurrahman ibn Auf, he had stables, houses, slaves, and, and you name it all over the place. In Iraq, in Medina, in, uh, uh, in Arabia, and so in uh, Egypt, and somewhere else. And Uthman himself. Now let's go back to the creme de la creme of the so-called uh, the, the power on the institution of Khulafa Rashidin. Uthman himself, he had at the day of uh, at the day of his death. 150,000 dinars and a million dirham. A million dirham. Dirham is a silver coin, historically, that is about three grams of pure silver. Multiply a million dirham by three grams, three million grams of silver. If 1,000 gram is equal a kilo, three million, Remove one, about 3,000 kilos of, of silver. Now try to understand the price of it today and see what. And the list goes on. Uh, the value of the villages he owned in, Wadi, uh, 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 in, in Arabia reached 100,000 dinar and left many horses, camels, and everything else. The, main, the most painful experience and outcome of these two specifically, I believe Abu Bakr wasn't able to do it. Not that if he had was given, he were given the opportunity, he would have done exactly the same because the mentality is the same. But Omar did it and Uthman did it because they were confronted with this huge wealth. Remember last uh, last night I pointed to it. 
And tonight, inshallah, tomorrow night, we, I'm going to focus on it. One of the most painful consequences of this uh, shura and ultimately coming to power of these individuals was what I call the political coup d'etat. And uh, sorry, the theological coup d'etat and the theological coup. You have corrupt leadership that thinks that they deserve the leadership of the community. Not only that, they can do whatever they want with the wealth of the ummah. Naturally, when you get to such a biblical scale, you need religious justification. And this is where the corruption, falsification, and everything else penetrates into the hadith. 1,400 years later, ISIS talks about hadith in Sahih Bukhari from Abu Huraira. Nobody talks about, okay, who was Abu Huraira? And this is the guy that for 50,000 dirham makes a hadith from the Holy Prophet. These uh, so-called uh, Khulafa al-Rashidin and after them Muawiyah and Yazid and everybody else, Bani Umayyah, collected court scholars that they needed justification for it. They would pay a little bit of money to one of these scholars, it comes up with a fatwa. Didn't we see it during the war in Syria? Wahhabi is giving fatwa that the so-called Mujahideen can have intercourse with their sisters. It's online. Why? Because then they will be able to fight injustice. Take wives, daughters from everyone, based on a number of hadith. That is now the biggest challenge. Uthman finished, Omar gone, the wealth are gone. But we are lumbered with huge amount of hadith fabricated to justify to justify these uh, tyrants in their attitude towards uh, the, the wealth of the, uh, the Muslims. And now these ahadith are being used. When Ibn Saud says, I am, I represent uh, Islam, and I can do whatever I want with the, with the wealth of the Muslims. The goal, I mean, the objective is the same. But the role model is what? Omar and Abu Bakr, Omar and Uthman. And immediately he has courtiers, scholars that come up with a list of hadith from, uh, from various books to justify the one that he did. They give fatwas, kill, maim, destroy. On what justification? Thousands upon thousands of Saudis went to Iraq and Syria and blew, blew themselves up, killing innocent people. Fatwas come from these creepy crawlies that uh, they still call themselves uh, scholars, religious scholars. And as soon as you say anything, open a book from Bukhari, Muslim, and others. This is the hadith. This is the worst thing that happened to Islam. It just deformed what we talk about, naskh in the Holy Quran, deformation, changing the face, change, Islam's change. And then you have Orientalists from Germany in the past century coming and reading these books and say, this is not a religion. That's the challenge that, inshallah, tomorrow night we would discuss. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, may Allah bless you all and keep us on the right path. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.